Tell your friends! Tell your friends about Hooks and Ladders, but also about songstudio.ca. You can get all kinds of information about songwriting, tips and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, like, follow and subscribe. That's what we need, that's what you need. Hey, welcome to Hooks and Ladders. What you're about to see is part of what we did at the Song Studio Workshop in Toronto in July 2022. There'll be lots more to see. We're just going to roll it out a little bit at a time. So sit back and enjoy. And if you want to know more about Song Studio, visit www.songstudio.ca and check us out. Enjoy. In 2005, well, I've, I've known Rick since about 1995. Actually, we met before that, but yes. but yeah. But then we became co-vice presidents of the Songwriters Association of Canada. And uh, in that role, we interacted a lot. And I thought, I really didn't know Rick's ba background as a rock god. I really didn't know. So I thought, this guy's not, he's a nice guy. I like this guy. And uh, so we worked together on various things. And then at a certain point, Rick said, I'm going to be retiring from the SAC, uh, but I've got a really good idea and I want to run it past you, see if you want to be involved. And the idea was to do a songwriting workshop at Humber College. So we did in 2005. And uh, changed my life, honestly, uh, in so many ways. Um, and working with Rick closely on the building of this workshop uh, has been a, a, great, um, uh, a great thing for me, and, uh, and I hope for our participants as well. So I want to welcome my old and dear friend, Rick Emmett as our keynote speaker this year. Here's a funny thing. When Rick walked in, <laughs> he was coming down the hall towards me. And I, and, and I went, hey, guys, and then kept doing whatever I was doing, uh, allegedly helping Alistair set up, um, and didn't recognize Rick until he was well into the room. And he said, hi, Blair. And I was like, oh, that voice. you know. <laughs> It really was a split second, but it seemed like a year. It was like, kind of like, that voice. Everything's in slow motion. <laughs> I know that voice. And anyway, and it was Rick. So, um, uh, yeah, that's funny. We haven't seen each other, we figure, in maybe five years. Yeah. Something like that. So it was more than COVID. Wow. We were estranged before that. Um, so, uh, so there. Anyway, real pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Guys. I'm really glad you're here. Um, um, I want to know, uh, since I just mentioned it, I want to know, what was it that was the impetus behind this? We'll go back and we'll do, yeah. we'll talk about yeah, other I stuff. I have but. a notebook where I had uh, some notes that I made. Oh, yeah, yeah. About the things that I was going to fly and stuff, too. So okay, yeah. I want to make sure that I have that uh, handy. Because I want to know. When we act. But go ahead and ask your first question. Well, my first question really is, what was in your head when you were thinking of a songwriting workshop? What, like, what? We, you know. I, it was actually, it wasn't my idea. It was uh, um, Joe, Curtis? Joe Curtis, the dean at, oh. at Humber. And okay. he came to me and he said, you know, we're thinking about expanding into more summer workshops. And we think a songwriting one, we already have a, a writer's and then a writing comedy workshop. one. Yeah. 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 And he said, so we think you're our guy. And I went, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> and then you thought, who can I pawn this Ooh, off Oh, I don't want to do this. Oh, geez, no, I don't want to do this. And then he said, look, Rick you know, carte blanche, you can, right. you know, do it the yeah. way you like. And I'd had some, uh, I'd been on the education committee for the SAC yeah. with John Capek. It was a two-man operation. <laughs> the you know, committee. Very Canadian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, we built um, workshops for uh, um, resource leaders across the, the country, like for so people could do regional workshops. And so we sort of banged out a thing that was like a guideline thing for that. And so I thought, okay, uh, that gives me a sort of a template of, uh, and I'd done, they, the SAC used to do those weekends. and Yeah, and yeah. you were already teaching at Humber. I was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very different kind. I wasn't teaching songwriting yet. Oh, okay, okay. I was teaching business and right. uh, music business. And, um, and then eventually I taught everything. I taught creative development things and, and uh, uh hmm. The, the directed studies. So students in their fourth year, the graduating year, I would sort of be a mentor to them, like a producer, sort of, that would just kind of be uh, available to them. Uh, and I would get as many as nine a year for that. So it would be literally like you're producing nine artists all at once, and they're young and they've never really done it before. They only had to do like 
12 to 15 minutes of, of recorded product. So um, it wasn't it wasn't crazy intense, but for them it was. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, and I sat on curriculum committees. That was a big thing, with uh, Brad Klump and and um, Mike Downs and uh, some really smart people. Yes. So that was a really great experience for me. Yeah. And uh, Humber, I mean, you know, the pay is bad. Yeah. You yes. know, yeah. but it didn't matter. So the workshop. They said carte blanche, and I said, "Well, what kind of budget?" And the budget was actually going to be pretty good. Yeah. And then I went, "My little black book is not good enough for for this thing. I need a guy that's got a better black book." <laughs> so then I phoned Blair, and I went, "He's got a pretty good black book." Yeah, the little black book he's referring to isn't a dating book, by the way. It's uh, <laughs> it's although that's pretty good too. You know, but, <laughs> but um, no, it was uh, he'd it, done Bluebird for yeah. years. Yeah, I, Bluebird North, and and I yeah. had my radio show, and I so I yeah. I had a, a you know what in the old days uh, would be called a Rolodex that was filled with uh, yeah. names of songwriters and people who could be mentors and and so forth. So, yeah, and and yeah. in the end, that's kind of what Curtis wanted. Joe wanted yeah. a thing that was like, hey, let's get you know, uh, he'd say, uh, I don't know, like I'm trying to think. He'd say, let's get Burt Bacharach to yeah. come, and I would yeah. go, Joe. Like, he's not going to want to come. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. you don't have enough money to make that happen. Yeah. Oh, we'll get him a limo. We'll put him at the Four Seasons downtown. I go, not going to be, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You're wanting to, people to give up their summer. And then he would be, okay, well, let's get Lyle Lovett. And yeah. I would go, that's a hard get. Yeah. In the summertime, that's a hard get. Absolutely. But yeah. I knew you were the kind of guy that could make those kinds of things happen. Well, yeah. And, and when you're booking those kinds of people, the, you know, I mean, COVID was really good for that in the sense that people were eager to do stuff and they could stay home. Yeah, and Lyle had a whole setup in his garage. He, you know, yeah, yeah. You guys remember that? The, he had a, he had a like a black curtain behind him. Do you remember how the interview ended? By the way, the the keynote. Kind of went down. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Jackie. He yeah. he he slid out of the well, shot <laughs> because I said, "All right, well, everybody, give a round of applause for Lyle Lovett." So then there's all the silent clapping that people do when their mics are off, and uh, but you can see them, you know, clapping yeah, and so they forth. Look and like then fish tails. That's clapping. right. And then and Lyle's just smiling. <laughs> And then I go, all right, well, there's a couple of housekeeping things we've got to do and so forth. And I started dressing the song studio people, but there's Lyle still there. Right. And, and I guess his computer wasn't nearby. So he literally starts sliding down uh, with a smile on his face. Like oh, he yeah. Know, he knows it's funny. Oh, yeah. Right. So he disappears from the frame, you know, like, like that, and then appears in the frame really up close so he can turn it off. But by this point, we're all cracking up. Yeah. So, and then he, that's, then he that's turns it He's got a very He's, dry yeah. sense of humor. And yeah. like, I, I, I don't know how much they, they expose about him, but I, uh, his road manager, when he goes out and plays live, is a guy that literally I trained. Yeah. And, and who, you know, always sends me emails and goes like, oh, Uncle Ricky, you know, I owe you my career, blah, blah, blah. So when Lyle plays, uh, I get to go and hang out backstage and, and oh, meet the guys. Right. And, and uh, you know, they'd play the uh, Casino Niagara with the large band. Yeah. Uh, I think it was just before COVID. Right. Uh, the summer before. And um, Lyle is like, he's like, a, 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 his family very religious, like Methodist, I think, Texan, like so, but he's, he's kind of like an old revivalist kind of, Preacher in Southern a way, Southern gentleman, real kind of laconic yeah. and you know yeah. and lazy and but he's sharp, sharp as attack. Absolutely, and, and yeah. He he's got a tour bus with the the back section is just all of his like suits, and yeah. his, and his boots and like it's his tour bus. Yeah, and it's it's all of his stuff, you know. That's and so amazing. and uh, the guy that used to be my road manager guy, a front of house mixer, he now wears these really spiffy suits, and I go oh. Like, you know, the rock and roll is now out of him. You know, so. <laughs> That's funny. Anyhow, well, okay, let's talk so, about songs. Yeah, all right. And let's talk about you, too. Um, okay. You, now, I can't remember. West End, East End, I can't remember. You're, you're a Toronto guy. Yeah, Burlington, no. Bur no, no, but I'm, when you grew up, though. Oh, yeah, no, West End. West yeah, End. right around High Parkish. Yeah, and area. Rexdale? I went to Bloor Collegiate when I went to high school. Right, okay, okay. So this area of town is Which I think they just tore down, by the way. Yeah, yeah I think they did, actually, yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, but the Toronto roots and how, when did you, uh, when did you start playing music? I mean, you're, you're as much known for your guitar virtuosity and your, and your singing virtuosity as you are your, your songwriting, but songwriting, when did you start writing? When did you start playing? What? When, when I was, uh, f first thing I, I, I got a guitar. Yeah. I learned two chords, a C and an A minor. 
Oh, and then I wrote a, a song that yeah. had a verse that went from the C to the A minor. Then the chorus came and it was heavy, so that went from the A minor to the C. Yeah. You know, and I played it for my mom, and my mom went, "You are a genius." And I went, "I have fans." <laughs> you know, but I'll, I say these things and it's like a joke, but I think it's it's v true that you need like some kind of positive support yeah. that, as you're developing, so that uh, and if you don't get it then you've probably picked the wrong career kind yeah. of thing. And I would say, even in career development with the musicians at Humber, I would say, if you're not, if the, if the business is not actually sort of giving you signals, you know, that you do an audition and you get the gig, yeah. you know, uh, th that's a signal that, hey, you, you got something going. But if, you, if you're auditioning and it's not happening and, yeah. you know, no one is really digging your stuff, then, yeah. you know, at some point you might want to face reality because... It's an extremely tough business, you know? yes. but it yeah. wasn't tough for me. I, I'll tell you the, the story. Speaking of Blur Collegiate getting torn down, uh, when I was a teenager, I was uh, a, a gifted athlete as well. I like I sang in the choir when I was a kid and church choir and school choir. I sang in the Kiwanis festivals at Massey Hall. And so I had that gift, but I was, I was also a gifted athlete. So, uh, and so the, this funny thing about Blur, uh, they used to run the 100 yards, not 100 meters, when I was a child, long, long time ago. And um, so I, one summer, I ran in the police games uh, at the exhibition, and uh, I ran a 10 flat 100 yards, which for a, about a 16-year-old kid, 15, 16-year-old kid, that was, that was a, a remarkable time. But the reason I think it was a remarkable time is because the official timers were the drunk guys from the Legion last night, you know, and they go, hey, I think, just like, I think it was 10, 10 flat. <laughs> so that gets printed in the paper. Yeah. And so then, you know, the next day it's like, hey, and so when I go back to school in the fall, we got a new track coach. He's the vice principal and he's got, he's got the paper and he's going, you've got the school record. I go, the school record. And they paint my name on a thing and they put it up in the hallway leading to the gyms. And so when they were going to tear the school down, I said to my wife, you think we can get that plaque from the, because like, ah, that would be cool. Yeah. But it was, you know, but apparently not. Apparently the, the, really? all the plaques and all the things got moved to a different school. And then, oh, so, so they're probably going to, they're still on, in, on yeah, display. they're not and, giving them up. And that would be Rick spelled with a C R I C K. It was a Richard. Yeah. Richard. I yes. was a Richard at school. Richard Evan. Yeah. I was always Richard. Yeah. Right. And I was R I C K uh, until, <laughs> I was a triumph and the first album came out and the, the bass player Mike Levine owed me money. We'd been out on the road and he borrowed some cash and he had to pay me back. So he wrote me a check and in his horribly sloppy writing, he'd spelled my name R-I-C on the check. Just R-I-C. So he phones me and he goes, hey, we're putting in the album thing. You know, I just want to make sure you, you wanted like six and 12 string guitars, right? Yeah, I go, yeah, yeah. I go, I hope you spelled my name right. And he goes, why? I said, well, Rick has a K on the end. He goes, oh, Okay. So instead of putting R-I-C-K, when he puts the shit in, it's now it's R-I-K. So 20,000 jackets by Attic Records get printed up. And it's like, I go, oh, never mind. Uh, it's fine. I'll, I'll be Scandinavian. It's showbiz, you know. So <laughs> yeah, Alice Cooper has a name, you know, Sting, these people, yeah, yeah. Madonna. They, yep. So I became R-I-K. Yeah. It was a very subtle it's Canadian thing, yeah. kind of showbiz thing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You're not presuming you're not going to change your name to yeah. Izzy Stradlin. I, I kept the Rick, but right. I just right. dumped the C. Right. Right. Nice. Nice. So you're at uh, Blur Collegiate. You're a gifted athlete as well as a uh, musician. So uh, David Steinberg, who you know. Yep. Uh, David, Michael Zweig. I don't know if you know Michael Zweig. I know the name. Okay, I don't so, really know the guy. So David and Michael were in a band when they were 14. And, well, David was 14 and Michael was 15 or 16 and Michael and I became roommates and Michael plays with Burton Cummings now and David is a lawyer who did the legal stuff uh, for a ma among many other things uh, for um, for the documentary on Triumph. It's all inter intertwined, folks. It and is. David will be playing drums for us on Thursday night. Um, but uh, David... <laughs> he still does legals for like Alex Lifeson. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. yeah. Alex and Getty, yeah, yeah. yeah. But he, um, he was in this band with Michael Zweig, and um, he had a hockey tournament, and it was the, it was the championship game. They, they didn't think they were going to go to the championship game. 
but when they did, he had to play it. And, um, but the band had a rehearsal. And Michael said to him, and he said, David, you got to decide. It's hockey or music. You've got to decide. And so David will quote that to this day. It's hockey or music, he'll say. And so you were in that situation. Well, yes and no. I, when I played, uh, I played a lot of football. I loved football. Right. And, and uh, I was way too little for it. I, I, when you're 14 and 15, you can outrun the guys. Right, know? right. And you but can be any size. But yeah. 16, 17, they start catching you and breaking you. And right. so that's what happened. And I, my right. knee got torn up. Oh, okay. And so, okay. Uh, did that decide for you? Yeah. I okay. was 17, and uh, clearly I was not going to, my knee was destroyed. To, it was not right. going to be any good anymore. Uh -huh. So I, I wasn't going to be able to do anything. So that's when I went, okay, I'm going to really concentrate on guitar. And I, uh, my last year of uh, my uh, senior year in high school, uh, I was only taking like three subjects because I was picking, you know, I, I didn't want to go to summer school. I was, I had become a poor student. Right. And, um, so my grades weren't very good. So I was going back to grade 13 and taking three subjects, but I was playing three nights a week at the Robin Hood Inn in Pickering, uh, getting like, I think, uh, 60 bucks a week or something, you know, 20 bucks a night, something like that. Yeah. But it was a lot of cash for a kid in high school, 60 yeah. bucks a week. But I, was saved, I saved up my money and I joined the union. And I had a, a bought a Fender Telecaster and a little Fender amp right. so that I now got jobbing gigs on the bar mitzvah circuit uh, uh, up and down Bathurst Street in, wow. here in Toronto. And uh, for a guy named Bill Burrell, who at the time was the music director at the Royal Alex. Right. So I wasn't a, a high enough level musician that I would get a, a pit job in, in an, at an orchestra kind of situation. But I was good enough that I could get jobbing gigs singing, you know, the Fiddler on the Roof medley for, for the... You know, get the little blonde kid to sing the fiddler on the sunrise sunset. Do you still know those songs? Like, yeah. could you sing? Could you sing? I'm not saying right yeah, now. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, see, sunrise sunset, swiftly go the days. I don't remember all the words. That's sunrise, uh, sunset, sunrise. Great tune. I'm willing to bet that this is the only time you've been asked to do that in an interview. Yes. Okay. And only only you, Blair. Yep, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, so you're doing that. What about songwriting, though? You're, you're playing these jobbing gigs. You're playing as a guitarist. You're developing yeah. as a guitarist. Uh, when did the songwriting well, start? Well, the, the whole guitar thing had, you know, went through that logical progression of the Beatles. Yeah. You know, everybody wanted to be a guitar player. And, and uh, then it was uh, Clapton, Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page. Yeah. So all of that. And, but that led me to sort of progressive rock. Right. And I really liked uh, the band Yes a lot. Yeah. And so Steve Howe was this guy that would play like a little classical guitar piece or a, you know, Chet atkins kind of style of playing. Yeah. So that was a, a sort of an ass-kicking thing of, oh, you know, I, I got it. But I was also, I went to Humber for uh, one semester. And the, mm. so that was the whole world of like Joe Pass and, and Wes Montgomery and, Everybody there was, you know, it was a jazz program. Right. So uh, I was getting all of that stuff. But as a, a writer, I, I wrote, I, I was, I did not discriminate. I did not have a strong sense of discriminating taste. I was kind of very wide open and liberal in my, in my, uh, what I liked. Yeah. That there wasn't much that I didn't. So, uh like, when I could listen to, say, Hank Williams and go, oh, that's incredibly great songwriting. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't, I wasn't going to go, I'm a progressive rocker. That doesn't, that's right. shit. You know, yeah. like, and there's so many musicians that are like that. Their yeah. discriminating taste makes them become very narrow. Yeah. You know, um, and that's fine. You know, if you folks have discriminating taste that makes you narrowly focused, that's perfectly fine. But you just have to realize that, there's a whole big wide world out there and you're missing out on some stuff that might have, you know, a, 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 a decent influence on, on where you might be able to go, especially when you feel like, well, I've painted myself into a corner now. How do I get out of the corner? You know, a lot of times your inspiration can come from something you'd never have imagined might be inspirational, you know? Like, when's the last time you listened to India, Indian ragas? Yeah, good. Like, in incredibly intense, unbelievably polyrhythmic kind of shit going on. And I can only take it for a, a short period of time. 
but I can take it. And I think that's, that's sort of what was happening. We hope you've enjoyed this little taste of the Song Studio Workshop in Toronto in July 2022. Stay tuned for more.